Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the Tech Careers Podcast. This is episode number nine and today I've got an interesting guest because she has a bachelor's degree in philosophy, worked in media production, but then went to a boot camp and has held various titles in tech since then. Some of them are software developer, infrastructure engineer, SRE, but now works as developer advocate at AWS. Join me in welcoming Linda Haviv. So I'm Linda. I'm so happy to be here. My name is Linda Haviv. I am a developer advocate at AWS. My journey into tech was untraditional, which I'm sure we'll get into a bit more. Um, you might be wondering what developer advocate means. And in short, I advocate on behalf of developers. I have a technical background, but now I get to do a very much a combination role where I get to also um, be a lot with the technical community and advocate on their behalf internally at AWS and um, be able to do everything from testing different services to writing feedback to creating programs that help our developers um, upskill and uh, you know grow in their careers. So yeah. Uh, there's been a journey to get to this point. I had a lot of different roles and I'm excited for us to chat um, and hopefully be able to help other people as they're navigating through their tech career. Because the beauty is tech has no one path and it's what makes it accessible, but also sometimes overwhelming, which is why I think it's important to hear different stories and uh, you know, there, there's no one way, one, mm -hmm. one side at all. So, um, you know, uh, kind of finding your own path, but also getting inspired around and asking around. So. Yeah. No, for sure. There, there definitely is not one path. And that's what we are trying to do is to reflect that, you know, doesn't matter what the situation is, what, what your background is, you can still get into tech. Um, but yeah, let's, let's, let's get into, into the details. Right. Um, I want to know if Linda, like the younger Linda was a nerd, like when you were 12, 13, were you, you <laughs> yeah. know, a computer fanatic. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I wasn't your, I wasn't a computer nerd per se. I, hmm. There were things I didn't realize I loved because I wasn't, I know a lot of people get into tech because of gaming or certain things. I did love computers and I loved certain things, but I loved a lot of things. And I was a lot in liberal arts. Mm -hmm. I was a lot in liberal arts. I always thought um, I'm very artistic. I was also in music growing up. I grew up in a very musical family. My dad's a singer. So I always thought I'm going to be in music. I was very good in school. Like I was one of those people that like was good at learning, but, which is why I majored in philosophy because I wanted something that does not have a straight up answer because I enjoyed the process of learning. But I always thought I was going to be a lawyer. And um, I never really thought I would be, I'm so sorry about my kids screaming in the background, by the way. Uh, this is part of my life too. I have two kids <laughs> and they're home right now. <laughs> no apologies. It's all good. So I thought I was going to be a lawyer. And I guess in the sense that there were moments in time, that, you know, Steve Jobs had this quote, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking back. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things that I realized there were inclinations of things, but I never took any computer science course or technical course really in college or in high school, um, which is why I probably w didn't see. And I also think subjects very much are an experience of also your teacher. So it's not always the subject. And a lot of times the yeah. wrong person teaching something could make you not like a subject because you're not being taught it from somebody that's actually like the right person for you. Um, Definitely. That happened a lot too. Um, and so for me, my journey was like totally, I shifted into tech two to three years after college. Um, mm. So I, I guess if you, in the sense of the nerd, I love to learn. Absolutely. I've always been like a person who was curious, yeah. but specifically tech, I, I didn't do much. There was a point where I did have a robotics camp for a week and I won first place and I was like nice. obsessed with it, but I don't know why I didn't think maybe this mm. is like, you know, it didn't click then. Um, it was like a one week thing that I did when I was like in Tel Aviv or something. I went to my grandma and like, they were like, oh, like, you know, they put me into, and I was like obsessed with it. Um, but I think I was always just, I loved learning different things. And I, mm -hmm. even in college, I thought I would be more in liberal arts. So I went into philosophy. Like I always thought I'm going to go that way, even though I like math and science, but it, it's funny. Um <laughs> So you see, life, life, you never know. And I think never box yourself into a, you know, mm -hmm. a specific thing because I could tell you this is the best decision I ever made and I love what I do. Um, yeah, so. 
that's what I wanted. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, great, great. So you you did mention college. Um, you don't have a computer science degree. You I do not. You have a degree, but it's in philosophy. Yes. So it has nothing to do with computers. <laughs> no, nothing. It's so more how, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I was going to say, so like, how did you start with computers? Like, what was the first interaction yeah. when you were like, oh, this is, you know, coding. This is code. And this is how it works. Yeah. So um, my first experience with coding was I post college, I was a philosophy major. I thought I would take my LSATs. So I took time mm -hmm. to study and post college, I worked in TV. I worked as a producer for, day for daytime TV um for a major media network and that was i interned also previously in college in warner music group and media companies and stuff like that so i thought you know i would do that for two years post-college while i studied for my lsat then go to law school and during that time i realized slowly that i was really looking to i liked law school to learn like mm -hmm. i wanted to go to learn i was excited about three years of school but I was not sure I would be happy as a lawyer because as I was speaking to more lawyers, they did not seem very happy. And okay. I also realized I am not an argumentative person. I could, yeah. I'm good at certain things, but it's not really in my nature. Like I could be good at it. There were things I liked about it. I think I loved the the deep like learning of it, but I, yeah. I think for me, the part that like, I didn't want to be, how do I put it, representative of a, of a very like professional, not professional, but like, like, I don't know, like very dry type, like, mm. I, don't mean to, I don't mean to listen, res mad respect. No, lawyer. yes, so, yes. <laughs> a lot of times I feel like what I'm trying to say is lawyers can't have their own company very easily. Like yes. it takes a lot for them to do their own thing. And I didn't want to be tied to a corporation. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't want my skill set to be tied. I wanted something I could freelance with. And I feel like with law, it takes a lot more to do that. Yeah. Um, and also like you're always representing other people. So I, I'm a very expressive artistic person. If I want to go with blue hair suddenly, I want to be able to do that. And with law, I feel like, and I may be wrong, it could affect a bit more of your profession than in tech. But I didn't, I wasn't comparing the two at the time. I just realized, hmm, do I want to go to law school? Or do I just want to go to, like, do I want to go to law school or do I want to be a lawyer? Like, is, what is the reason I want to go? Uh, um, mm -hmm. You know, and it's, it's, it's a big cost and it's a lot of things. And while I was in that journey, um, I was doing a lot of different job, like types of tasks in my production job. So in TV production, when you're starting out, you do everything. I mean, you end up, you end up like, you know, you're taking things, dry cleaning, you're producing segments, you're getting like... Mm -hmm at 3 a.m. from like a from like a different room and trying to run them in two minutes to a, to a tv place you get it, it's it's so many different things you're writing i mean it's it's a lot of different things and one of the things i did was i was building a website for one of the anchors for her book and this was like uh one of those things where i needed to, to do some custom code for something to happen there and i was like mm, that's interesting, interesting. So I yeah. looked it up and I was like, oh, and it was something super simple. But by doing that kind of sparked my interest. It was like something front end related. And mm. then I was like, oh, this is cool. And I started looking up meetups. Like I started, I took, a, I think a Coursera type. Oh, or it was, oh yeah. Code Academy, Code Academy. I took code like one Academy. of those Academy, like, you know, like start learning to code type things. It looked really fun. And then I started looking for meetups because I'm a people person. So I'm always, start, the first thing I do is like, okay, how do I learn more about mm -hmm. this? Um, and um, the meetup culture in tech is huge because it's like, it's yeah. very much about like sharing information and, and innovation. Um, and that really excited me. And for a year I was self-studying and just started to like try to understand the industry. Mm -hmm. I, they, I like within six months, I knew that this is something I want to potentially pursue. And I paused my law school direction. Um, and then the, the question was, what do I niche into? Yes. Um, and it took a while for me to see what are the different fields, what, you know, because I was scared. I was going to quit my job. At some point, I realized I'm going to go to a coding boot camp. I was trying to look at different coding boot camps. I was looking at the different ways I could do it. I was working at the time, you know, I was walking in sometimes 3 a.m. I was working really like hours that were like a bit ungodly for me to like actually be consistent with learning. And mm -hmm. I knew that I'm also a community learner. Like I need deadlines and I need people. And knowing how you learn is really important. Yes. Um, you know, I know different people who had different paths and that worked for them. For me, I needed a, a boot camp mentality. I needed 
three months of intense building on, on other topics because I felt like I cannot do two things and I prefer to take a loan and, and quit my job um, because I felt like if I'm going to do this, um, I'm not financially able to do this potentially to quit, but I should take the risk because it's three months. I was going to go do a degree and mm -hmm. compared to that, it's worth, it's worth me like trying this. Right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so at some point I did a lot of research. Um, and through that, I also thought at first I would go into mobile development. Okay. And what I realized was that, um, as I was asking around, I was always checking also about the job market and yes. I worked in a media company my transferable skills at that point were I used to work for a media company, right? Like if I leave, right? Mm -hmm. How do I leverage my understanding of a user yeah. in an industry that I'm already in? Because when you're starting, you're starting from scratch. And I was mm -hmm. like the first job, I realized the first job is the hardest to get. I started asking even in the company I was at, I, was, I started finding out who the digital people were, who was building the websites. And I went, I ended up getting connected to the head of digital and I, I pretty much was like, Hi, I, uh, I would love to stay in this company and I want to shift into tech. I really want to learn what you need. Um, hmm. I was thinking mobile development. Can you tell me like, what are the rules you're missing right now? And is there anything, cause I'm going to quit and going to study. So I will study at my own expense, but I would love the opportunity to potentially apply if you have opening. Yeah. I know this is a three to four month boot camp. Mm -hmm. um, and nobody's going to promise you, but you want that, you want to kind of build those bridges. And, um, he was telling me mobile developers at the time were not in house. They were hired by agencies, but he was looking okay. for job developers, which is why I then looked for a program for web development and specifically JavaScript at the, the bootcamp itself was about Ruby and had a little bit of JavaScript, but I knew in my head, my goal is mm -hmm. to learn mm -hmm. the fundamentals, to know how to learn fast. It's all about like getting that start about learning how to learn because you're always going to be a forever learner in tech. Yeah. Um, it's more about knowing how to grasp quickly, getting some of the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. um, and Flatiron School was a great experience. It had a lot of experience. Uh, it gave me a lot of experience working as a team. So like doing group projects was very mm -hmm. good. Like, like every, all that, the deadlines are very intense. It was, I was there 18 hours a day grinding. Like it was, it was a great way for me to really a boot camp. Yeah. Um, and I went in person uh, to, so I, I did quit. I took a loan um, mm -hmm. and I, I went, did that, the, the program. Um, and then I, I did apply back to that company. I did apply. I did also interview with other places, which were cool. Oh, okay. Um, one was a finance place, but I felt like I also, I wanted to feel like I, and it's not a must. Like there's so many transferable skills. You can work in Starbucks and you understand people. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, the point is like there's transferable skills and, and tech jobs are not just about coding. So you have to sell that too. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, it was much easier to be like, I know all the people on, on the user end. I use your site as a producer. I had to use it, the CMS as an author yeah. to write on your site. So I would love to build this tool because I understand it from the other end. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not maybe the experienced JavaScript developer that I want to be yet, but that is my, you know, like, I understand the other end, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To land the junior job, and from there, really learned a lot, and you know, a lot more. You learn a lot more on the job, but um, from there, I, I got to work on a lot of really cool uh, events and 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 different projects, um, elections, Super Bowl, um, and building a lot of JavaScript live maps of data, nice. <laughs> like and and. Um, the, the company I was working for was a partner of AWS. It was a customer of AWS. Um, so, um, yeah, th then there's a whole trajectory there that, I, that I, that I went into, but, um, first my JavaScript role was like two, three years off. I'll pause there. Cause I know I'm talking so much. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's, <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. To the other shifts I've done <laughs> after that. <laughs> yeah. 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 So the first role that you had in tech was a junior. Oh, Junior software developer. Junior, a junior JavaScript developer. And at okay. the time, JavaScript was considered like the front end of the site. Yes. Um, while I was working that job, we started using Node.js. So my job nice. shifted into like API building. Um, so it until was like then, a... it was like, I was purely the JavaScript. Like we would build everything with PHP and some, but, my, but and like, you know, my main thing was all the logic um, with the JavaScript end. Um, they were, some things were with frameworks, some things were vanilla, some things were jQuery. Um, it was very like 2015, 2016 
enterprise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, over time, there was a lot of involvement. Um, we started using Node, the stacks are nice. changing. We started migrating data into AWS. We started using cloud. I didn't get to do that as much in that role at, in the beginning because I was in the web development end. Mm -hmm. but, you know, that piqued my interest. Um, and we could get into that. But I think the key for me and one lesson I want to give people is the first job is the hardest to get. Try to find the lowest, like when you're, it's not about where you start. When you're in tech, I feel like it's easier to then shift once you're in the industry. Definitely. But finding the lowest, the lowest barrier to entry for yourself is important. That matters, like kind of like where you live, what are the remote opportunities? Mm -hmm. What, it, based on your experience, what can you sell about yourself, even in your college or like extracurricular activities or volunteer work, like all these things matter. Um, yeah. It's all about kind of saying, I under, and people love when, like they hire somebody that understands the user of their product, even if they're not, they have all the tech skills. I think it's more rare sometimes because. Definitely. Yeah. yeah it, 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 so, so if you're able to sell that, it's sometimes a good way to package when you're trying to get land your first role. Like, and I think um, you do bring something to the table, right? Like you do mm -hmm. have this like understanding of the user. So yeah, I think that that's, the, that's one of the things, like, I think for me, I was ship. I think it was great that I shifted from mobile to web because of, you know, I still wanted to do mobile at the time, but it was just like, that was the lowest barrier to entry. And I knew mobile would be much harder for me to get into because it wasn't an enterprise role at the time. It was a lot of smaller companies, agency startups. And I didn't feel like I had like the, the it's not that I can't, couldn't, but I knew it would take longer. My goal was, I also got married. I didn't want to wait too long to have kids. Mm. I had other things I was calculating in my head. Like I, I wanted to do it all at the same time in some respect. But I had to make some, you know, I had to meander, right? Yeah. Uh, the startup wouldn't be the right place for me. No, uh, definitely. You know, I, yeah, not that, for me personally, I didn't feel like it would. Um, and that you, th that's why every person has to look at like what are the priorities they're looking for, what is the lowest barrier to entry, and do the research around. Like, take the time to talk to people around your industry, your area. Um, so it's really it, it helps. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was going to say that. I think like I'm seeing a trend with, with your story here is that you do a good amount of research and you ask like really important questions before you jump like too deep into something. So like I see that you, you talk to, you know, lawyers or people in the industry who were working in law and you realize like, okay, you know, this might be not a fit. And I think that's it. That's the amount of work that you can do to better understand what you want in your career, because it's, you know, it's going to be a major part of your life. Right. Um, and then I see that with, once you had an interest in mo like mobile development, you were like, Oh, maybe I should ask within the industry if, you know, it's something that's hot and something which has less barrier of entry, like at the company that you were working for. Um, so yeah, I think that is a really good, takeaway that the audience can take is, you know, ask those important questions and also do like a good amount of research. Uh, and once you feel comfortable, then take the leap of faith. Uh, but yeah, talking about the transferable skills, that was another great point. Um, I started my first role in tech was tech support because I worked at a gas station and I knew how to deal with customers. And my resume was like everything about, you know, customers. Like I can be patient. I can deal with angry customers. And it's such an important skill. Like people it is. come to a gas station in the most like rogue way. Like that is harder than any other exactly. enterprise. <laughs> yeah. As much as I want. So I did have two months at the same company. I worked as an intern, as an IT admin. So I would have loved to be an IT admin, but I did know like they were not giving me an offer for IT admin. And I'm like, oh, do you have any other openings? And they were like, oh, we have, you know, tech support. I'm like, sure, because I have skills yeah, that can be transferred. And then you move forward. Like, just like you said, you know, there's, you find that lower barrier of entry role. And then in tech, it's, it's really easy to pivot, which we'll see now because I know, <laughs> um, yeah. After now doing front end, 
you kind of was all were also looking at you know back end with node.js right. and api building so yep. kind of the full stack um experience that you yep. have now you also saw that they were moving things to cloud and i i don't want to jump forward but yeah. i think this is where you kind of pivot yeah uh, into your sre so or infrastructure work... engineer role yeah so i work so it's interesting i was working around three years i was working web development three years i had my first kid and i um I was, I loved it. I was doing a lot more like backend also and, mm -hmm. and kind of everything that was JavaScript related, I guess. And one of the projects I was working on was elections. And um, this was 2016 and 2018 midterms. Um, so we were building up for that. And um, at the time, like a lot of the data was being moved uh, to, to cloud. And one thing that was also being explored in 2018, a lot more was the two, two screen game, right? People used to watch TV for election results. And then you also had the digital end and that needed live data updates. Mm. That data was not available till that day. That moment would come through a system. And that is like data maybe coming from sources like AP. It's not coming from the news outlet. Yes. So um, the news outlet has like a whole team that, that deals with that. And it's called, it's like they have statisticians and all that, but mm. we get it through like live data that then have to display on a map, right? Live. Yeah had a refresh and the workload to get that data and then normalize all of it while you're getting it is all on the cloud. And the mm -hmm. infrastructure of getting that into the API I was using to then generate all these visualizations was so fascinating to me. And even also like the whole deployment part, like everything yes. was magic to me on the web development end. And I feel like you get credit a lot for like the, the, the mm -hmm. things that, right. And it's awesome. But I knew that if that server went down, I have no, <laughs> you know, like if that, like how they upkeep millions of people on the site yeah. and the architecture there was fascinating to me. Um, and it felt like a macro problem and I was curious. Now, during that time, I was also kind of deploying other applications on like my first service with AWS that I used was like Elastic Beanstalk. I was mm -hmm. trying to put a node app on there and I was doing like middleware applications. And I started like dabbling with the AWS dashboard because of that. And I was also building Alexa skills. So those were like my first two projects starting to dabble with the AWS console. Mm -hmm. And between that and the projects I was working on, I decided I should get certified and take the AWS solution architect certification. Cloud practitioner did not exist yet, uh, the cloud yeah. practitioner certification. Um, and I used that as a guide, but I didn't just use it to study. I used it to start a lunch and learn. So what I did was I made an internal lunch and learn of everyone who wanted to study for the solution architect certification. Nice. And then I would give myself a deadline that I would teach it every Friday. Not that I knew the material that I would study and teach on a Friday <laughs> every time. And one, it gave me a deadline. Two, it allowed me to connect with like-minded people in the company who were also learning. And then without realizing, I was starting to learn about the projects they were working on. And Slowly but surely, that lunch and learn turned uh, like was kind of noticed by the and the infrastructure end, like the team that runs more like the, the infrastructure, and they decided to connect me with the AWS accounts team, and the AWS accounts team decided to have me uh, work with them to start certification training programs that are internal. <laughs> so nice. I started working with these huge like training programs with AWS and. Over time, I was so involved also in the infrastructure and I was get I was kind of like in the know what was going on. Mm -hmm. I was learning from people, like my friends became the people. So I was curious, I was, I was like the lunch and learns were really a way for me to kind of like look to see things de facto. And then I would have them speak and I would learn about what they're doing. I would always try to see and try to give examples of things that are actually being done in the company. And by doing that, I was able to find out what, what how things were built. Mm -hmm. um, and it was like a natural progression. And so um, there was a, um, a opening for SRE and I, I was kind of in touch a lot with the, with the team that was building like more of the infrastructure end. Um, and they were doing the infrastructure for the whole like company. It was like, you know, there's many, like there's the news, there's sports, yes. there's all these things. It's like, we were, they were doing the CMS and the, like all of that. So, um, uh, a media company. So, uh, I ended up having, there was an opening for SRE and my first, my shift into really that end was SRE, um, site reliability engineering. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was definitely for me and I had to upskill a lot on the SRE end. Um, 
it, it was also like, I feel like it's defined differently in different companies. Yes. Like, the role kind of becomes a little bit like a gray area, depending how big the company is and the team is and what you're dealing with. Like, I felt like I was doing a mix of things um, that were observability based, but also like infrastructure mm. based. Um, I then shifted more to infrastructure engineering. Um, and yeah, it like, sorry, that whole, like that, it, <laughs> the long story short is I ended up really working on that end. And, uh, and I also was already kind of for, even before I shifted into that role involved in many ways. And it was yeah. just, an awesome like natural progression progression um, mm -hmm. and then during that time i was also in the aws community builders yep. program for like two years and was also connecting with the aws community at large and i was documenting all the stuff in co with content mm -hmm. and somebody on the aws team uh that, that's developer relations noticed my tiktok about aws because i keep nice. talking about AWS and tiktok and they and that's how i got pinked for uh, an interview nice. <laughs> for, for developer advocate role at, at, at aws and and now I, I i get to work my dream job so um it was like a very yeah. natural <laughs> like it, it's like when you follow your passion you want to share with community and you enjoy learning and like i never really i planned things but i didn't plan like it was like yeah very much that. um but i did kind of know about the developer advocate role and i could get into that too oh, um and it kind of interesting yeah, when I was going into meetups, if we backtrack back to my days where I was going to meetups before my boot camp days, I went to a Google meetup and there was, it was called technical evangelism at the time. And there was somebody named Sarah who came up mm -hmm. and spoke about Firebase. I looked at her role and the fact that getting to build and getting to speak to people, which is like my dream combination. I love people and I love tech. And at the time I was like, I'm going to do this 10, 10 years down the line. Like I knew... I knew this is something I that, yeah, 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 but like, I didn't, I didn't want, I mean, I think developer advocacy is like great when you're like years of, like after you do like a lot of hands-on for a while, um, because you want to be able to relate and you, you get to build, but you get to build a lot more for educational purposes versus yeah. pod and it's different. Um, so for me, like, I kind of like knew that I would end up there just because of my person. Like I knew that my personality likes that kind of stuff. Like I love mm -hmm. the combination. Um, but I, but there's phases in life and that's also good. Yes. You know, like you kind of need to, like, for me, like there was a phase that I did not want to be people facing. It wasn't that I didn't love people. I was still doing it on my social media, but I just wanted to like build. I just wanted mm. to put my music on and code and build. Um, and then there was a time that I was more interested in the architecture, which was like the time I was more in the SRE end. I just wanted like more of the building blocks and more of like the business end and like the, the up, up time and the reliability yeah. and the, and all that. And, you know, so it's, it's like, there's never a box. You never box yourself into like one Definitely. Thing, yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 Like if, if I ask my four year old self, if I want to be public facing and uh, <laughs> teaching tech, um, yeah, I think I would have said no, but as I evolved, I realized, you know, teaching is one of those things that I really love. I love those light bulb moments when you see these oh, amazing yeah. developers and they're like, Oh, this is how it works. And I'm like, yeah. And you have a gift for it. You really do. Um, I'm, so I've, I've been following you for a very long time. I, I remember fi I found out of, of, like about your work through like GitHub, um, the GitHub report that you did for people to upskill into like DevOps and, and these different mm -hmm. roles. And honestly, you were, you were filling a gap that was really important because I was trying to upskill myself at the time. And there were not enough resources that really gave you a bit of a roadmap. It's such a vague and even yeah. the words are vague, DevOps, like mm -hmm. culture, but like some people are called DevOps engineer, but it's also yep. a culture and there's so much to it and it gets involved. And it's like, it gets complicated. I think it's more, I think it's almost like you always need something before you go to, like you kind of need yeah. like some fundamentals because it could be really abstracted and confusing. <laughs> Definitely, um, I think. That was no easy feat and you made it like hats off. It was an incredible job. You and Gwen, m amazing job. Um, no, thank you. Thank so, you. Um, awesome appreciate the feedback and the love. Um, but yeah, no, I think, I think that's where you mentioned a great point about going into advocacy with some level of experience, Yeah. because I see a lot of people, again, we can yeah. I, I try to stay away from, you know, tech Twitter oh, debates, yeah. yeah, yeah. but people are like, oh, you know, you can have a developer advocate role um 
which doesn't require any coding knowledge or, you know, you just need to know a little bit of tech. And I'm like, I guess it depends on the role. It depends but on the role. In I... a general sense, if you're a technical evangelist or a developer advocate, you know, you. I, I, I will have a take on this one. Um, <laughs> because. Let's, let's hear it. Yeah. I So there's a reason AWS doesn't hire under a certain level um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. developer advocates. Like, you don't really become like, and I like that they do that because I don't think I would be a good developer advocate beginning of my career. You can't really earn the trust. It's not, you could have all the skills of like the other part, but that happens. It doesn't need, doesn't need to be like, I'm not saying like, oh, you have to do five years. It's about quality, not quantity, mm. but like to work, to understand your user or to understand the person. It's like, it's like somebody running something, but they've never done it themselves. It's like the same kind of thing. It, it becomes even challenging for them, I think. Yes, oh, maybe yeah. there are exceptions to certain things. Um, I, I don't want to like make a blanket statement, but I personally do not recommend to my younger self to be a developer advocate. Yeah. Because yeah. The, it, it's very, you have to be much more autonomous and like know things that you've experienced. Like, yeah. you know, you're always like, still learning, but like you need to have some level of like, hands-on for, for, for a while, like building Definitely. like things and, <laughs> and experiences, you know? Um, and that doesn't mean like, oh, it has to be like 10,000 years to do that. But it means like, I've seen people in two years build things and get mm -hmm. experience that was more than somebody that was six years doing something, right? So not saying it's like a time, it's like, but it is some sort of like hands-on work that you yeah. need to put in, that you need to experience to Definitely. then- properly be able to advocate on behalf of developers because that is the job exactly um, yeah so. like my my imposter syndrome is already you know it, it comes and goes i can only imagine if if my younger self was a developer advocate like i i would feel <laughs> such a fraud going on stage and talking about different services that i have never worked with yeah um and imagine it's, like you, you, you're getting asked a question that's yeah. too deep about some service that you don't it's, understand. It's almost like you have to also build a confidence to know that what you don't understand, how to navigate what you don't and be really yeah. true, honest with your audience. Like mm -hmm. there are many times I got asked things that I don't know, but I'm more confident even the way I'm directing it because I am now confident with, I don't have to know everything. I know how to, I, I need to know how to relate to the right thing. Yeah. And I upskill all the time, but like even the confidence of knowing what I don't know and being confident about like, it's okay. Like getting yeah. the right people, like you have to know the fundamentals of like, mm -hmm. thing, you know, it's almost like I was much less confident saying that stuff in the past because I would take it like, oh, I don't know. I'm a fraud. Yeah. When, yeah, yeah, yeah. If I'm a, I'm a general de developer advocate with AWS, which has 200 plus services, right? There are things I get asked that I will not know, but I know who to pull. And I know over time, like I'm confident, like to know which area something is in. Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. I know it's like fundamentals to navigate. Um, where like when I was earlier on in my career, I would not, it, it, I would be missing that part. Yeah. Uh, and that's hard to earn trust with your community, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and it's not that like, you know, I don't want to discourage. I mean, I think, I think it's more like, when you build and then you advocate kind of, you know, just building is important and being able to relate to your audience is important. doesn't mean you have to build everything and know everything, but you do need to get to a point that you've had experiences that you can relate, speak on, understand the issues that are for developers, you know? Definitely. Well said. Um, we got one hot take from Linda. Uh, <laughs> I'm very <laughs> Like I want um, the job. <laughs> yeah, that is that is my yes. that is my job as a host is to at least get one hot take on the show. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, okay, okay. Going back to I, I, I saw you mentioned that you had the solutions architect certificate. You know, I'm I'm one of those person who who has I I don't even remember now. I have it's many certifications <laughs> which I don't think add any value a at this point, right? I think after third or fourth certificate, I yeah. felt like, okay, th this is just another badge that I'm collecting. I want to, I want to ask how important was that solutions yeah. architect certificate, but also 
I want to keep in mind that it was back in 2016, right. uh, 17. Uh, this one was in 20, uh, 2018, 2017. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So like the, 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 the times have changed, right? right. Yeah. Getting certification now won't just help you stand out. Yeah. I think for me, it's always been like the intention of what you need out of the certification, right? So I, you, it goes back to how you learn mm. so the concept. Okay. Let me first say this. Certifications do not lend you a job. They help you upskill potentially. Um, I think you have to be intentional with them. So uh, what I mean by that is I needed to get introduced to AWS fundamentals. I wanted to understand things beyond just what I was building, which was like maybe mm -hmm. some, from a web development aspect. And I like following a course. Yeah. So I use the solution of architect associate certification as a guide to give me a broad introduction about things and best practices that I was not aware of. Mm -hmm. Did it help me land a job? Yes. Was it the reason I landed a job? No, it helped me because it gave me an introduction to things. Would getting an additional cert help me land the job any faster? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that you should, it depends what you're trying to do. If I want to learn machine learning specialty because I'm interested in that with AWS, that's great because I'm upskilling intentionally with ML. Right. Yeah. Because I, I want to get introduced with a course and it's just an organized course, regardless of if I take the cert. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's more like I very much look at it as a guide, not the key to the job. Does it help? Yes. Does the, the fifth one help at that point? It's wonderful. It's wonderful. And it, I don't, you know, it's awesome, but it doesn't like, it's not a must. Yes. Uh, and I think you have to always look at the gaps in your res, like, you want to fill certain things. So let's say if you're a web developer and you're coming also with a cert for AWS, that's cool. Like, cause it shows you're giving yourself some cloud computing, whatever, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But if you're already working in something specific and you like, you know, some people need certs to qualify for certain things in their yes. job. That's a little different, right? They need like a certain amount to have like- To uh, be a MSP or- right, yeah, 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 right. And that's a whole different aspect. Um, I do think it helps you get introduced to certain things, but does not, it's like when I see people, I think the the, the, the miscommunication happens. It's when people have no background and yeah. they go just for the cert and there's no hands-on work being done. And that doesn't give you a job that could help mm -hmm. you get introduced to things. But cloud is like one of those things that sometimes you need also other fundamentals. Like I think the confusing part with cloud specifically with cloud search specifically is there are adjacent skills that are needed. Yeah. You don't have to be all, but they could be networking, coding, Linux, doesn't need to be all, but you almost need that to get a full grasp of cloud. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you don't come with one of them, and then it's very confusing to give people like a route. And I, I would love your take on this because like, I think, I think that's what you did very well with learn to cloud. I think you were giving people like more like project based. And that's my thing. You could give yourself also a cert, but I think working with projects and building things using AWS services is very helpful. If you want to get introduced to everything, Solution Architect Associate is great. If you're a developer and you want to specifically learn how to use yeah. AWS as a developer, it's great. But again, intentional, like ask yourself why. Listen, and there's some people who love to get certs and that's fun for them. And they also learn from it. it does, it's not that you don't learn from it, but definitely the part where like people think they will just get a job from a cert on its own is not the case. Can help. Again, know how you learn, Mm -hmm. If it helps people just trying to do spit back, it's a little different. So, um, yeah, no, I think you, you put it re really well. Um, I, I really resonate with that, even though I have so many certs and, and the I reason know. is I, I, I did, I, I did an experiment, right? So going back the, the, the basic cloud practitioner, which I see Reddit posts or tweets that, Hey, I passed it in two weeks, whatever. I don't care because. For me, it took three to four months just with cloud practitioner. The reason was because I was using it more of as an introduction to AWS. Um, right. I didn't know what EC2 is. I didn't know how VPC works, even though I know what Linux is or Windows servers are or how networking works. And that's, I, I was grateful because I had those fundamentals working in IT. And once I, I'm like, oh, all of these just translate into cloud and these are just services but I'm still going to take my time to build something. So it took me three months and that's when I set my exam and passed it. But fast forward now, because now I have so much hands-on experience. I went with the DevOps pro without any preparation and passed right. it. I'm like, 
Because that's more to verify your skill, right? Exactly. It's not even like you don't need to. But I love what you said because I think that there's a difference between passing and learning. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. If somebody's just looking to pass, that's not you're not getting the value of nope. the serve. Um, yeah. It's like it, if it helps you get unblocked with learning something new and going in and using it with like hands on as part of it to get a better grasp. That is like for me it was like that's what I did with Solution Architect. Like mm -hmm. I, it wasn't even about passing; it was about using it. I used it to build community, to uh, to build like yeah. a lunch and learn, to then like make content, to like to like learn to build and like I was building a little bit on one end, but I got introduced to best practices about architecture. Mm -hmm. And um, I did take the cloud practitioner for fun after, but I already took the solution architect one, which was like, <laughs> and I failed the first time I took the solution architect because I took it kind of early and then realized my gaps. And that's another thing. Like there's so many things that you notice, like even from a question standpoint, that I was like, wow, like I didn't have a full grasp of VPCs. Like I need to go mm -hmm. back and build with it, like build. And that could help, like failing helps. Failing is yeah. bad, like me failing or passing. It's like, it's like, where are my gaps in my knowledge that I did not understand? That's helpful. And that made me be like, Linda, do hands-on projects with this. Mm -hmm build this from scratch, build the whole architecture from this. Uh, like, and it helped me in like, when I went into like an SRE, and first, but I, I, I think it's such a good point. It's really the phase that you are also in your career. Yes. No, yeah. definitely. Like, what are you missing? What are the things you need? Like if you're just taking it to take it right for you, like you don't need to take like associate level at this point. Like just, you know, you're taking the pro, you're validating your skills. You're already like probably write a question about it. Like, you know, you could probably write part of the test at this point. Like, you know, it, it depends where you are. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, yeah. So, figure out the difference between passing and learning. Um, yeah. is the take. And everything is what you make of it. So, as a boot camp, I could tell you there are people who go to a coding exactly. Boot camp, they complain. Listen, not all coding boot camps are created equal. I will say that there are some terrible boot camps. Mm -hmm. uh, I loved the one I went to. Um, there are many that I saw people have not good experiences. They're not all created equal. Absolutely. Additionally, even if it's a good boot camp, it is what you make of it. You have yes. to be dedicated to learn um, and you have to want to build on those concepts. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's meant to give you an environment to do that, but it is what you make of it. Like I did prep, I did study things that were going to be in the bootcamp before the bootcamp. So I could go with a faster pace and build on it because it was so much information. And I was trying to make the most of the experience. So even with boot camps, there's kind of like a similar lesson as certs where it's like really what you make of it, right? Mm -hmm. You can go to, first of all, not all boot camps are created equal. So I want to put that out there. There's some that are great. There's some that are not. Um, yeah. There's no, like, there's nothing that protects the quality, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. fully. Like it's not a school, um, accredited university, you know, type of thing. Um, but there are very good boot camps. And even then you have to make the most of the experience. So for mm -hmm. me personally, I prepared like some of the material before I went to the boot camp. So I could go, I, I, I studied on my own things I could a little bit just so I could walk in and feel, one, it helped my morale. And I knew I was going to get thrown into so much information that I wanted to make the most out of building on the advanced things. And um, it, it's not a must to do, but I think like it's about making the most out of something for your mm -hmm. future and learning and not just like to say I did a boot camp. It's the same thing with like certs. Um, use it intentionally, maybe either to validate something or to like learn something, yeah. you know, like, and not, you know, the pat, the past or the, I did the badge. The yeah, path, yeah, yeah. Right? Um, it's wonderful. It's not, it's not the main thing because you are going to need those fundamentals for your career. It's not just, it's not there just for show. It's there because it has information that's important. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and the interviewers are going to find Oh yeah. During the interviews. Right. So yeah. If you know it and you know what, a lot of the, you know, it's funny. Um, I went to a solution architect interview not long after I did the architect associate. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions I got asked was very much, I knew the answer because of the cert, um, because I built an art, but I never worked as a solution architect at the time. And of course I yeah. didn't I qualified at the time because I only worked on the web development and I, I needed to be, and I, I realized because of that also that I needed to be really sitting in the weeds of the cloud end. Mm -hmm. And interviews are sometimes also good to know where your gaps are. Yeah. Um, which I always recommend also doing. Awesome. Awesome. So two takeaways. <laughs> failure is um, a learning experience. It's not a failure. Awesome. I, I wanted to ask you how I, I, 
I know it's been going great because I, we, we talk offline, um, but how how are you feeling? How has the journey been in tech so far? Yeah, I mean, exciting. And, and I, I really do feel like I'm a professional student. Um, I look back, I had my birthday not too long ago, and I was like, you know, I'm I'm so grateful I get to wake up in the morning and do something I love. Of course, when you're in the weeds of things and things break and, you know, you're just like, mm-hmm. you sometimes like get frustrated and stuff like that. But I really feel like for me personally, I made the best decision of my life. Um, I think it also gave me other things, not just the job I love. Um, it feeds my curiosity. Mm-hmm. I could evolve. I could reinvent myself within it. Like if today and now I'm studying AI ML, I'm not a pro in AI ML. I think we all, many of us are trying to upskill in certain respects there yeah. because it's going to change many jobs, even within the jobs you already know. Mm-hmm. And um, it's never boring. I'm never bored. I'm always challenged. And it deals with real problems. And there's so many industries within tech. So it's very different for me working now for a tech company versus working for a media company. It's different yeah. challenges. And it's exciting. It's like it touches everything. The other thing was the flexibility. Like I'm able to also, in some respect, be present with my family. That mm-hmm. was also really important to me. Um, and I felt like especially probably not in this role, but more with that when I was like in technical roles, apart from yeah. the call. But like more in the more in the technical roles, it mattered that I got the job done and I could code at 3 a.m. if I wanted to, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Now I have a lot more people facing type tasks, so it's a lot more you know people facing. So there's there's a lot more of like a less flexibility. But even then, Mm -hmm. I feel really flexible. Um, But when my kids were young, you know, I I had I was coding and I was building and I felt like I had flexibility to as long as I completed it, I was able to do it whenever. And there was something really awesome about that. you know, and I, I love, I love that aspect. And I feel like I could be expressively myself. And that yeah. is also really important. Um, that going back to why I didn't become a lawyer. Um, you know, if I want to be suddenly in music again, like, it's just, I just feel like I could find my, there's an artistic part to tech. Mm-hmm. So you're building mm-hmm. products and you're building cool things. I love also the tools we use in tech. I do like coding and all that, but I also like the products we build. And it's so cool to bring something that you're thinking about to life. There's something fulfilling about it. Um, you know, one thing that was, one thing that I, I really appreciate about tech because I had an untraditional journey was when I worked in like media, I worked in news and news could be very heavy mm-hmm. and um, bad, bad news is what trends. And um, unfortunately, I think like a lot of the time I would be very exhausted because there's no answer, you know, mm-hmm. and with tech, I could be deep in something and usually there's some sort of answer and mm-hmm. you feel a check on something that you like completed and there was something so ridiculously funnily uh <laughs> therapeutic about it to me like things could break and yeah. you know i would laugh because over time of course that maybe not not like yeah, yeah, yeah. watching but you know like it's there's something about it that was weirdly therapeutic about it like mm-hmm. I, I don't know how to explain it like i could be like challenged but there's probably an answer yeah awesome like or even if there's not, maybe the world be down the road and like, you, can- <laughs> um, you know, like, I don't know. There's something like awesome. You can say yes or, or no. Right. Like life isn't like that. And yeah, no, I, I get it. What you're trying to say, yeah. it. you know, and when I mm-hmm. went, go through hard time, like it just is relaxing to me. I got lost in the problems of like my project and I, I, you know, I love it. I love moments. I lost track of time I was building something. Those are my favorite moments. So nice. <laughs> nice. By experience. What do you think? Is something that you would like to mention that's bad about tech? If 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 you find anything that's bad about tech, no, I think everything has its um, yeah. has its good and bad. I think you know if we think about AI, I mean, we also create a lot of problems. Um, mm-hmm. As we create products, we have by byproduct of it. Um, things that are concerning to me are are things like I love I love AI in, in many respects. I also am. I think there's a part that like the responsibility of it. There's things. Mm-hmm not always intentional it's the byproduct Mm -hmm. um, that we Mm -hmm. aren't aware of right that we have to be responsible for right now we're in a time it's it's an it's a fascinating time but it's there are things that you know could like we do need to keep a pulse on and it's not always like oh it's you have a lot of intention in tech but tech also has byproducts that are not intentional and Mm -hmm. with something like ai that is absolutely something that we need to keep a pulse on so um, I think things like, like, I know, like even Amazon, we have a responsibility AI team and like, we have a lot of, it's very, very important. It has to be intertwined security. Yeah. 
um, within like referencing of, of AI, even like in, in, in how where we're pulling information, it's mm-hmm. very important. Um, and even from a building standpoint, like you could build things with now with AI generated, like, you know, generative AI, like type code that's generated from ChatGPT. And then you're like, okay, but if you don't fully understand the problems, like then how do you find them? And then it becomes like a lot of like noise um, there are other problems we're going to have now that yeah. also will be new jobs because of it. Um, but I think there are problems we also create at, with advancements of tech and definitely, yeah. uh, definitely something that could also be bad, right? Like many times. So we have to, um, steer with caution and, and responsibility and try awesome. to, possibly- yeah, no, I think, I think that was, yeah, that is, that is one challenge that I think will continue. Yeah. Um, always with tech. Um, but yeah, we, we need to be responsible. I'm, I'm super paranoid about cyber and, you know, deep fakes yeah. um, that, you know, now we have the power in our hand to generate those. Yeah. Um, but like, even I look at my kids, you know, like I, I, a lot of the times, you know, I don't ask questions about myself as much. Right. And then mm-hmm. I notice something about my kids. Right. And I'm like, Hmm, like I personally don't put my kids a lot on social media. And that's because it's almost like I want to give them the choice to be on social media because yeah. everything's public and there's so much you could do now with images like mm-hmm. deep links. And yep. I don't know, like, and, and again, this is no judgment on anybody. I, I don't yeah, yeah, yeah. know, like I don't judge anybody. If I have friends who put their kids on social media, you know, I have a bit of a pres- presence that's like more tech related. I don't think it's related. Also, I mean, I show it in stories, show the back of their head. I don't really, and maybe close friends see like their faces, but mm-hmm. it's not, um, I, I try to, give them their privacy because that they're not able to sell me if they want that or not. And I'm not going to make that choice for them at this point. Um, Cause I, I, I wonder, you know, I have like this theory that because we're so much online that a lot of us will, I think the next generation might choose to be anonymous mm. um, and hide behind avatars because they'll yearn for privacy. Yeah. But I don't know, but it's a dynamic, you know, like, Life, life is in cycles. But anyway, I, I think like a lot of us like are, I love social media and like, I love being on social media. I wonder if like there'll be future generations that are so tired. Like I see like younger generations now, like kind of like looking for that time without their phone and looking mm-hmm. for those like secluded. I mean, listen, even for me, it's important. I, I was luckily I grew up without like the influx. Yeah. Um, I think it's definitely hard to navigate like pre- present moment with tech. Um, yeah. When I say tech, I'm talking social media, right? That that's very specific, right? It's a different type of like you can be in tech and not like deal with social media, but social media has become a part of our life also in a digital environment, and mm-hmm. um, it is something that mental health wise we're navigating, right? So of course we're same same theme, I guess. Like there's a lot of like serious topics. Um, Definitely. So. Cool. Um, yeah, I think I, I I loved I loved our conversation here. Um, but I want to be respectful of our time. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm gonna, so I'm to the, towards the end of this podcast, what I do is I ask kind of some preference questions you yeah. know, and you, you can't think about them. You just have to say it. Well, just go. Okay. Just go. Yeah. So first one is what do you prefer windows, Mac OS or Linux? Mac. Okay. Okay, so you're a Mac person. <laughs> Maybe Linux sometimes. Depends. Okay. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna guess it's Linux for servers and then yes. Mac for your phone. Yes. <laughs> exactly. It depends on the use case. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Cool. Um favorite programming language. You know, it's still JavaScript, although I like Python now. Nice. The spacing nice. drives me insane though. Errors yeah. every time and I'm not used to it. Um, I'm used to the quirkiness of JavaScript. <laughs> nice. Nice. But yeah, I think you tried to Mellow that answer with saying Python because I love Python. Um, you can do a lot. Okay. <laughs> yes. What's your go to code editor right now? VS Code and Cloud9. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Those were the questions. Yeah. Very, very good. <laughs> end on a positive note because I think I gave some doom and gloom. I think tech also solve so much so much yeah. of you these problems and i'm very excited and grateful to work in this industry and i think if you're thinking about it or looking for it there's so many things you could also be a part of and it's important mm-hmm. to have the representation of perspective and diversity and places you come from and so um i think it's one of the coolest industries to work in 
Awesome. Yeah. I, I just love the support system we have. I don't think any other no. industry has meetups or, <laughs> you know, boot camps or even like free, you know, educational stuff at the scale that the tech industry has. Um, like we're so welcoming and like it's supportive. So different. Like we met yeah. the community. Like, yeah, I don't think it's like this other industry. It's like no, very. It's awesome. It's mm -hmm. it's it's awesome. I'm I'm glad I was born in this time for that. <laughs> so <laughs> awesome. Any any last uh, words or advice yeah, or it's tips? Stay curious, and and as long as you just continue with your curiosity, you will succeed. That's in tech for sure. Words of wisdom. Well, thank you, Linda. Thank you for coming on to the show. Uh, it was great having you. I'm I'm glad we could, you know, finally do this. But it was it was great. great it was so great. I, I I'm so excited always to get to talk to you. You're amazing. You're crushing it. I'll be checking you, of course, always in the digital world. <laughs> you in person yes. soon, one of our conferences that we'll cross paths on. So as always, sure. look forward to it. Thank you.